to decrease the cycle. Yeah. 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 Panel, the euro is a currency that's that functions on a fixed rate, right? We believe that the euro necessarily functions in a manner that takes away the ability from individual countries to go ahead and value or devalue the currency as per the domestic needs of that particular country, but rather goes ahead and concentrate power in the hands of few countries which are able to do influence on like foreign policy and domestic policy as, as far as like economies go, right? Let us look at what the how it is that the euro was created and how it is that it functions right now, right? We believe that the euro was created in two particular kinds of contexts, right? Number one, it was created in a context of no alternative, right? We believe that this whole idea that smaller countries were like painted this picture that if you do not enter this idea, if you do not go ahead and subscribe to the euro, then you will possibly have no other alternative to trade with neighboring countries, which means that you will eventually be isolated in what eventually went into like be the European Union. It's something that was driven across as an agenda, right? We believe that it is on a principle level unfair on these countries to go ahead and like give them the threat of isolation simply because of the fact of them not subscribing to a currency while it remains a fact that the incentive that exists to go ahead and accrue profit because of the fact that these countries are also markets continues to exist at the same time. But the second context in which the euro was created and functions right now is in the sense of power differentials, right? Let us look at the simple idea that major economies who go ahead and control how the euro functions, which are countries like France and Germany, right? Let us look at what the economies of these countries are dependent on right now. These countries are heavily invested in manufacturing, right? We, we believe that the fact that these countries go ahead and like go ahead and invest in like consumer goods and the propagation of like manufacturing goods which often is in the range of like electronic items, automobiles, etc. are all factors that are to the complete ignorance of what the economies of smaller countries like Hungary and Poland are based on, right? These countries are based on more primary sectors of like economies which are, in, which is to say that these are based in agriculture, right? We believe that this simple idea that now the value of that particular currency is going to be determined by how the world reacts to these consumer products in the sense of like automobiles and electronics but not in the sense of what domestic needs exist because of like the fact of like maybe having microfinance so that like come, come, these farm, like individual farmers could go, could go ahead and go ahead and like deal with ideas of like how expensive it is how inflation is working etc or all things that are really important having said this and having established this particular context let us look at individual harms that come across because of the existence of the euro right three particular harms that to identify on opening government number one the euro provides order for these powerful economies to go ahead and arm this arm to smaller countries which was evident in the case more like most recently in the case of like Greece and the and, and the EU right second idea of how it leads to greater ideas of like euro skepticism within the European Union right now and thirdly of the inability of smaller countries to trade or to like an indulge in international trade on their own terms right on the first idea of arm twisting speak of the whole idea and the whole situation with what Greece was faced with wherein austerity measures were imposed upon Greece as a forceful forceful in a forceful manner on the threat that if you do not do this we will go ahead and cut off supply and international aid to your country which means that you will eventually enter ruins is something that's really problematic right let us look at why exactly this is problematic we believe that the simple idea that Greece need not have that much incentive to go ahead and encourage imports from these powerful countries like, like uh, France and Germany into its own economy but on the other hand needs to have that particular freedom to go ahead and focus on what its own economy is based on in order to engage like in order to enhance international trade from within the country is something that's really important right at a particular time where these countries are uh, these countries are like uh, the victims of like arm twisting in through the hands of these powerful economies that control the euro right now what is the result of that right we believe that very particularly and this is really important for this debate right local populations suffer the most because of this right the simple idea that people within in Greece had no other alternative but to function on the same lines as those like powerful countries like France and Germany tell them to is something that's really problematic, right? The fact that now France and Germany will go ahead and 
like force Greece to set up those kinds of manufacturing units which enhance the like automobile industry, for example, or the electronic industry in comparison to the fact that Greece's own economy might be based on the dairy sector or might be based on the agriculture sector are all really crucial things that need to be contended with, right? The simple idea here is that in a situation where the economy is not ready, for example, in order to go ahead and, for example, not having adequate skilled labor in that particular economy or the fact that you do not have adequate resources to simply allocate to the, the kind of industries that these powerful countries want you to like, allocate towards is something that's really problematic and takes away incentive from those countries to go ahead and actually cater towards the demands and needs of the local population is, and we believe that these are people who suffer the most, most but before that, close it. Speaker, we believe that this exact idea that you will continue to go ahead and trade with neighboring countries is something because of which the like this house go when going ahead and regretting the euro means that the kind of trade that continues to exist will continue to exist like even in spite of like the, this particular motion, right? We believe that the existence of the common market is something that's really important to understand. Agreements, for example, those that Switzerland has entered with the European Union, those that Brexit, after Brexit, the UK wants to enter into with the Euro European Union, are all examples of the single market, right? We believe that it is indeed possible for these countries to continue to work together in spite of the fact that they do not have one cor common currency to buy, co common currency to bind them together because of the simple incentive that continues to exist, that these are markets that can be exploited. On the other hand, there are additional markets that can be exploited because of the simple factor that now you are the one who determines the value of your own currency. On the second harm of Euroscepticism, going like going forward with the harms themselves, right? We believe that let us look at the countries in which the feeling of Euroscepticism is the most dominant, right? These are particularly not countries like France and Germany, which have indeed benefited from the Euro's existence, but these are particularly countries wherein the benefits of the Euro have not seeped into the lowest common denominator, right? What does that mean? Countries like Hungary and Poland have particularly gone ahead and like have started feeling resentment towards the Euro. In union itself, right? Let us look at what is the problem with that. The constant threat of inadequacy of the domestic government in controlling the economies domestically, plus the inability to control the economy itself, because of the simple idea that you have absolutely no control over how you value or devalue the currency, meaning that in a situation where you don't think that your farming sector is like is uh, has like a uh, has adequately like boomed, or in a situation where the farming sector has not adequately received impetus, you go ahead and value your currency in a manner which invites foreign investment for example, are all factors that are really crucial. In the absence of this, local populations going ahead and feeling this constant threat of inadequacy has led to the creation of Euroscepticism. Right? We believe that additionally, the fact that we are debating this particular motion in the context of the refugee crisis is really crucial. Right? We believe that the simple idea that because of this inadequacy, this constant feeling that my government is not providing enough for me, how is it that I am supposed to share this with other people who do not even belong to this particular country is something that constantly goes on because of the like failure of the Euro itself. On multiple levels and on multiple stakeholders, we believe the euro has made the world very proud to stand and propose. Thank you, Prime Minister, for that speech. I invite the leader of opposition to open case for side opposition. Thank you, Prime Mr. Speaker, I will primarily be talking about three things, right? First, about how the existence of a unified market is something that does not exclusively exist on their paradigm, and the kind of unified market that we want is something that can only exist with the euro. The second thing I will be talking to you about, how stability in the euro is something all countries benefit from and something developing countries benefit from more. The third thing I will be talking to you about, how this leads to an incentive for the EU to make countries develop equally, right? And we think that's a good thing, right? But uh, yeah, first, about how bigger countries necessarily strong arm 
you know smaller countries and the whole mischaracterization on the part of side uh, government right we tell you that is not necessarily true right we tell you that all countries like in the eu are given adequate representation in all big institutions such as the uh, central bank etc etc right whenever major policy decisions are made we tell you that it is an equal voice that is heard right and it's wrong for them to just tell us without any concrete examples that smaller countries are strong now the one example they give and i credit them for it but i will destroy it in a second is the example of greece right they say that greece did not want any austerity measures and like it was the bigger countries that were enforcing this on greece we tell you that is quite important right because we have a problem when there is a debt of like billions of dollars in your country and you start subsidizing movies still and you don't end that because of your populist and because of you know uh, policies that will get you more votes we think because of these kinds of things since the entire our uh, community that is the eurozone right which has the eu right we tell you since ev- like everybody is affected by your policies they have a responsibility to ensure you don't start implementing fuck all and stupid economic policies that is going to affect not only your people which you should be protecting but are not because you want to be at par and secondly like it's affecting other countries right which is which is something you shouldn't be doing anyway right so we tell you that this is a, a self check mechanism on smaller countries to like have better policies and this applies equally to like bigger countries right so coming to the point of like another point which was like currency manipulation which was one of the greatest benefits that they said is taken away when you have things such as the euro not right now thank you right so they said that the uh, that countries cannot manipulate the currency but we think that's a huge problem right because we tell you that on our side sure a smaller country can't manipulate a currency but on their side when a big country manipulates a currency we tell you that leads to way greater harms for the smaller country right we tell you countries like china for example manipulate country currency all the time right to make their exports like more viable in other markets right we tell you this necessarily hurt smaller countries more right we tell you that china does not necessarily need to do this but it will do it and it will affect smaller countries right so i don't understand who their primary uh, like stakeholder is and who they want like the debate to benefit right because on their side we understand there is a harm right but what is the greater harm is something that everybody needs to uh, like be unanimous on right so we do not agree with like all any of the benefits that they say that like the euro deprives them of right so now coming to the importance of a unified market right understand that when you have a same currency right it makes free trade easier right and we tell you that this makes investment like uh, makes it easier to invest in these smaller developing countries right because of the comparative advantage that they offer in terms of whatever whatever like cheap labor raw materials etc etc we tell you that this leads to first like it, it's it's a good thing because free trade lets leads to development in smaller countries because otherwise you wouldn't have these big countries big companies coming into your uh, uh, coming into your country and trying to develop by increasing the amount of development and the kinds of uh, industries that develop and therefore like raising the standard of living over a period of time by generating growth right we tell you these are the kind of things that that are only possible on this side right because because we tell you that massive overhead costs of like why does this happen if the eu is not there right because first we tell you that there is a massive overhead cost like of converting currencies and that is a disincentive to have free trade free trade right then also what happens is like if you want to invest in another country and you necessarily need to like every time convert it into that current uh, currency and that like in general makes it much easier and much more likelier for bigger countries to invest right therefore increasing growth in that paradigm and the second thing is like even to attract consumers right it's easier for them to compare prices when it's in the same currency right and those are the kind of advantages they really need to counter from their side right now why is it good right because we said we say that even smaller countries now have a larger consumer base right so if i'm a company in a smaller country right the uh, people they think are the primary stakeholders but really not like we tell you that even they now have a unified market that they can sell their goods in right we tell you that's a good thing we tell you that these two like better products for smaller countries because of investment coming in because of bigger firms coming in right and uh, uh, like this yeah but before the next time this is another but the benefit of free movement of both the exports but still maintaining control over exports thank you okay and but understand why it's important for developing countries now to have a stable currency as well which will not happen if these state if these countries are like given 
have their own independent currencies, right? We tell you, for example, Greece was more likely and was and other countries made an incentive to like bail Greece out because it was affecting their own economies, right? I mean, you, this would not happen if it did not affect these bigger countries, right? That is a benefit that you need to disprove, right? Now coming to why euro as a stable currency is helpful, right? We tell you that first, it's important because now you cannot screw up interest rates and monetary policy, right? Because of because we tell you that what happens is that all of these countries have an incentive to do that to boost their own type of that their exports, etc. Right? But we tell you when stability is achieved in terms of a central bank regulating this, we tell you there is a greater likelihood of it being stable throughout, right? As a result of which these smaller countries are not harmed. And second thing we tell you is that different economic activities are what leads to different economic kinds of growth in different countries, right? So we tell you that when demand shocks and supply shocks like occur, they don't hugely affect these smaller countries because we know that gets balanced because of other economies, right? That is again something that they need to counter and tell us why this is something that developing countries and smaller countries are harmed from, right? Another thing that they need to understand is that the real comparative here is not benevolent, benevolent countries uh, that will any way help out smaller countries, right? comparative here is that those countries who will try to manipulate their currency, bigger countries, who will try to exploit small, uh, smaller markets, etc, etc, etc. Those are the kinds of countries we want to like have checks against, right, in terms of having the euro because it gives a power to the smaller countries to like ensure that these bigger countries don't manipulate their currency. And second, even if these smaller countries or any countries trying to pursue absurd economic policies, we tell you it imposes a responsibility on them not to by the international community. And for all of these reasons, we are today very, very proud Mr. Speaker, multiple rebuttals. Firstly, on the idea that equal voices voice is heard in deciding Euro policies. Three responses to this. Firstly, international diplomacy. Second, secondly, how voting is done in, in the European Parliament. And thirdly, the idea of populism in countries like Germany and France. On the idea of international diplomacy, Mr. Speaker, we do not believe that voting has an equal voice. In, in the sense, sure, they have numbers, right? But that does not necessarily mean that they will always vote for something which is best for them, simply because there are powerful countries like Germany and France, which for the reasons of international diplomacy and soft power, can essentially result and make them vote in a particular manner, which like they like, right? Which US often does in the United Nations and which Germany and France often do in the European Parliament. And in fact, that power to do this is in fact furthered in a situation where they control the Euro and where their products are the ones on which Euro depends and hence, and the countries are still forced to subscribe to this particular sort of a currency, right? So we tell you that this arm twisting that happens is something which is exacerbated in a situation where already you have a power differential between countries because of their economic, financial and military situation. Moreover, when they also control your currency, in that sort of situation, this arm twisting increases. Secondly, the idea of voting as a bloc versus voting as individual uh, individual issues, right? We tell you that bigger countries like France, Germany, at a particular point of time, England used to vote together in the European Parliament, especially on financial matters, because they had similar needs, because their level of development was at a particular stage, which was similar, right? Whereas compared to a country like Poland or Hungary, which already has lesser representation, even numerically in the European Parliament, and even if it does not, even in that sort of a situation, they do not vote as a bloc, right? They often vote on individual needs, which are specific to those particular countries. And hence, those voices, sure, they are there, but there is absolutely no tangible effect of it, because the policies that are passed are only the ones which these powerful countries powerful countries favor anyway. Now this idea as to why they have differential policies, right? Here is where they make the biggest mistake. They believe that the biggest stakeholder for Germany and France is the European Union. No, the biggest stakeholder for Germany and France is Germany and France, which essentially means that the governments of Germany and France and their fiscal policies and their monetary policies will be hinged on populism, which pleases their market. What is their market? As Nikhil Arigas has characterized it for you, it is of industrial, electrical goods, etc., which are very different 
from what the needs of these other countries are. And in order to please these people, they need to please these people. Plus, moreover, because of they, the soft power they have, they have the ability to please, please their own citizens. And hence, for all they care, the citizens of other countries don't really need to much derive much benefit out of it. Now, or later. Now, this idea of that manipulation is not so. This idea of you know uh, currency manipulation, right? Now, this is funny, right? Because they seem to believe that. The euro, euro is something which is not manipulated, right? Euro is something which largely stays, stays stable. Two responses to this. Firstly, euro is manipulated, but it is manipulated by people who don't care about the smaller countries in the first place. Hence, it is manipulated by Germany and France according to its own needs. On the second idea, that if even if on the even if we accept that best case scenario that the euro is really stable and it is not manipulated and attracts investment. Two responses to this. Firstly, many a times smaller countries, especially developing countries, do need to manipulate. The the currency which is which need not be stable for example india right india often regulates its currency in response to what the world trade is and the reason for that is because india attracts investment attracts trade in a particular manner which is suitable to its own needs and on the second idea right mr speaker we tell you that the, 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 the idea that a stable currency necessarily invites in investment no stable currency does not necessarily invite in investment in a situation where because like euro is not just a currency which is a standalone like theme in this debate right because also with euro come in financial regulations also with euro common trade regulations and because you have a common currency you also need to have a common financial policy the problem with that is that there are certain regulations with france and germany can deal with in terms of labor laws in terms of what are the kinds of things that they import or export etc which these smaller countries can't and in order to invite an in, in, in investment they need to have an independent monetary and independent financial policy which with the euro being present they are not able to have on this idea of who would have had the greece if incentives like in the incentive in terms of euro did not exist right? multiple responses to it firstly if greece knew that no one would help it out then it wouldn't have engaged in the stupid like fiscal policies in the first place so we tell you mr speaker that this this the safety net which euro essentially provides is something which is not necessarily good right because if you know that someone is there to bail you out then you would probably you would probably go ahead and engage in more populist measures which are not good for financial uh, in financial matters for the long run on the second idea even if it was a really bad situation and who would have had to help we tell you that there are international organizations like the international monetary fund like the world bank who helped out india who was not part of any common currency in the year 1991 when our foreign exchange was really low right mr speaker we tell you that the reason that these monetary institutions and financial institutions exist in the world in the first place is to ensure that finances and markets in the country stay common so we tell you that in absence of the eurozone they would have stepped in now mr speaker what have we told you through the course of this debate right as to why this arm twisting happens we told you that industry needs are different and people tend to cater to populism Anyway, Mr. Speaker, coming to a non-like economic and monetary uh, issue, which is really important for this debate, right? We tell you that euro and the arm twisting, which results out of it, and the reason that arm twisting essentially happens is because, of course, countries have different needs and different soft power capabilities. Essentially, results in countries feeling like they are they they are, they are being subjugated, that their policies are being subjugated by other people. What that essentially results in is euro skepticism. Mr. Speaker, who are the people? Who which are the countries which are most likely to take refugees in the today's world? Right? It is essentially Germany and Canada. Why? Because they have their own independent financial policies. Canada, because it has its own like currency. And Germany essentially because it controls the euro. In that sort of a situation, Mr. Speaker, the point is that in but even in that sort of a situation, the biggest refugee burden is on countries like Greece and Italy, which have comparatively weaker economies. And in that sort of a situation, uh, protect, sorry, in that sort of a situation, they are less likely to take in refugees further more because they already seen that their needs are not being respected by the European Union, which demands humanitarian rights out of them, which demands certain compliances to international norms regarding refugees to them, but still does not let them regulate their market. Mr. Speaker, we tell you that in a situation where their financial policy was a little more independent, they were more likely to take in refugees, and hence the world would probably be, be a better place. Mr. Speaker, this inability to trade on it on its own term for something which is extremely important, right? Mr. Speaker, we tell you that when euro exists, and this is where they have ignored the debate, right? It's not just about the currency. And we give you examples of situations where despite having different currencies, Countries have still been a part of very successful common markets. For example, ASEAN. For example, Switzerland. For example, the NAFTA agreement, which essentially results in common markets for different people, where 
countries can benefit from each other's markets despite having different currencies but what the added advantage of it is that they have their own monetary and their own fiscal policies why must the speaker our fiscal policies important is something which we have already proved to you this is because we believe that the most vulnerable stakeholder in this debate is the one that we need to cater to are these smaller countries because bigger countries will be fine and they find they might go in a little bit of loss but the people who will be really badly hit by bad markets are these smaller countries and we believe that euro affects them the most negatively very proud to stand on Mr. Speaker, countries make bad decisions, especially bad economic decisions, all the time. That's why the Greece crisis happened, where the Greeks decided to spend so much on welfare spending, so much, so much on pension spending, and not actually care about its debts. And Mr. Speaker, the reason why this happens is often these countries are subject to things like world bank politics. Often they're incredibly short term, is only looking for benefits in the next election, right? We think for that reason, this idea that countries get to control their have control over their economies, it's, it, it's not a silver bullet on that side. It doesn't automatically win the win the debate. What they have to show is that there are absolute objective good things that accrue at the point where you like where, where the euro goes away, right? We are going to talk about particularly two things. First of all, why free trade is benefited, which is an objective good for these countries, and on the side where euro exists and secondly we're going to talk about why the currencies in these small smaller countries are more stable which is beneficial right we think these things don't depend on the whims of individual countries they're just objective goods before that a few points of rebuttal right first of all this idea about euro skepticism right uh, we think euro skepticism happens more if most of the benefits to economies go away i'm going to sh show you why there are greater benefits euro skepticism happens more on that side where countries don't benefit economically very much i'm going to tell you why that happens more on that side secondly mr speaker we think yeah on our side because there is more free trade more engagement with the rest of the european union we think there's more of an a, more of an understanding that we are part of the same community. You interact more with other people. So we think your skepticism happens less on that side also, right? We also have no idea what refugees are doing in this debate because we don't think EU that necessarily deals as a block with these refugees. You can still put individual sanctions or individual diplomatic pressures on individual countries. We don't think they have any relevance in this debate. Finally, this example of like NAFTA, Switzerland, ASEAN, these countries are doing great, why, even though they have different currencies, right? The counterfactual is not clear in the, those particular countries, right? It could definitely be true that in the alternative, where they had the same currency, they would be doing far better, right? So just by throwing examples, they don't necessarily take that case. Now I want to talk about EU's control over the currency, right? This is the biggest problem that side of the side government has with the EU, with the euro. The EU controls the currency, right? Uh, like it can raise the value of the currency, lower it, and that's a problem, right? What we offer in response is that there are like important limits to the ability of the European Union to do that. The first thing that we said is that there are like representation on the European Control uh, Central Bank, which like sets these rates, right? These representation is not based on your like GDP or these kinds of things. It's just based every country has a vote, Mr. Speaker, right? So the kinds of things that they talk about that takes over this, things like soft power and diplomacy and countries are going to strong arm you, we don't think are as important, right? At the point where like small countries such as Hungary and Poland knows that if I agree to this particular monetary policy, it's going to fuck up my economy. It's probably going to care more about that than the sudden soft power of other countries, Mr. Speaker, right? We think furthermore, at the point where EU tries to strong arm other countries and like makes them accept like has bad monetary policy, which has terrible effects on the other countries, there is more euro skepticism, right? There is like more of an ability for those countries to leave the euro. So European Union, because it wants to stay as a block, stay as a whole, because it like increases those benefits, it probably doesn't want to do that. Furthermore, we think like if London, France, etc., can vote as a block, we think Hungary, Poland, etc., whose economies are like more agricultural, etc., and those kinds of things can also vote as a block and like create the same kinds of benefits that they're talking about. Okay, I'm gonna talk, talk about uh, before I move on. I'll take closing. 
the regular unified market doesn't need a unified currency. Then all these changes can be liquid. You can have all exchange forward, the divided schools and foreign exchange benefit because more money went away. Yeah, those things do exist. We said on the comparative, there are there is easier like in a world in which it is safe currency, it is even easier than that. I'm going to talk about uh, like free market later on. Like, first of all, Mr. Speaker, this whole idea that economies of these countries are different, right? We agree that they might be different and there might be different monetary policies that might be required there. We, however, don't think that that's a long-term goal, a long-term sustainable solution for these countries. We don't want Hungary and Poland to fall in entire, like entirely of the history, be dependent on agricultural economies or manufacturing economies because they are susceptible to the shocks of the market, right? At a particular time, if some other country becomes more productive, the demand for that particular sector goes down, these countries suffer usually. It's far more, but more beneficial for them to diversify their economies, trade more with other countries, specialize in other products as well, Mr. Speaker, right? Also, we think most countries are moving to things like service-based economies, which require in the like in initial term support and engagement from other countries in terms of experience and expertise, right? We think in the world in which these countries, small countries, have the same currency as the euro, European Union and like big countries have an incentive to help them in the form of funds, in the form of grants, in the form of loans, etc. Why does that incentive exist? We think because the strength of the rest of the European countries, Hungary and Poland, etc., impacts the strength of euro as a whole, right? And we think that is a, 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 an incentive that makes like countries like Germany care very strongly about countries such as Greece. It doesn't want Greece to go down because that also negatively impacts them. So like these countries are likely to help them like diversify, diversify the economies in general. About free trade, rather than told you that free trade is beneficial because like you can trade your comparative advantage, like if you are like have lower skilled labor, you can send them to other countries, etc. You also have access to larger markets. All of that's really good, right? We think first of all, why trade is beneficial on our side is because see, in a world in which other options also exist. So for Germany and France, like they can choose to get laborers from Bangladesh, they can choose to get like laborers from like the like, set of industries in like India, etc., or they can do that in other countries in the European Union as well, right? The comparative advantage that these countries have in the point where they have the same currency is that there is no overhead cost in terms of currency conversion or like setting up different, different industries and like going through those kinds of procedures, Mr. Speaker, right? The second comparative advantage is access to the consumer market, right? Because consumers are more likely to buy your goods at the point where there is something that they, they can use to assess the prices, right? If they're used to a particular currency or if they're used to a, a particular currency, like more laborers are going to be used to that particular wage level and assess whether they, or not they want to do that. In a world in which currencies are different, they're going to be more skeptical because they don't understand like what, what those prices actually represent okay why is like uh, stable, uh, okay i'm going to talk about the actual counterfactual which they haven't dealt with in a world in which euro doesn't exist we think there will be currency manipulation by countries like uk and france to like maximize their sports and exports and dump products on the other countries their response was that other countries can also do this right the reality is that they can't because like organizations such as imf and world bank impose certain restrictions on countries to not do that the reality is that the big countries such as uk and france are able to get away with it because they have more of a diplomatic power in those in those particular contexts. That's why China is able to get away with currency manipulation. This is a real comparative that they have to deal with. It uses all of the analysis of soft, soft power and arm twisting on that side. Finally, Mr. Speaker, rather have told you that EU's currency is generally more stable because like it's less affected by like shocks in certain industries, etc. Right? Small countries, small countries don't have the same kind of stability in the long term because they are more dependent on certain markets and can like it can radically change on that basis, right? That's mean, that means they're less attractive to investors because that uh, currency is not as stable, with Ma 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 Mr. Speaker. For those reasons, very proud of us. This We think it's incredibly patronizing for opening opposition in this debate to say that Germany and France know what's best for you. Therefore, you should do what Germany and France say. There's been very little analysis in opening half as to how having individual currencies means that you have better control over your policy. Because while they've asserted that the euro is going to be more stable than individual currencies without actually analyzing why, we are going to be the team that does that. 
two points of extension. Firstly, why it benefits these developing countries when they can switch to their own currency, and we're going to tell you why the alternative world is better. And secondly, in terms of the worst cases of recessions, we're going to tell you why it's better in that case as well, giving you analysis as to why this world is better. Something are opening. One like large point of rebuttal to opening opposition before that, that is, can the single market function even if we don't have a single currency? Look, we've pointed out repeatedly in POIs that Switzerland still functions with the franc, right? They have three problems as to why there can't be a single market without a single currency. The first was that there are massive overhead costs with regards to forex conversion, right? Okay, this happens all the time, right? You can hedge against forex fluctuations by having things like forwards and options. This happens everywhere, right? So for, for example, Singapore and Malaysia largely have the free movement of goods and labor and have different currencies. That not That's not too much of a problem because you can always hedge for fluctuations in currency. Secondly, they said that people can't compare prices when there are different currencies, right? Okay, like use a calculator, use Google. Like I'm not sure why that's really a problem. That was incredibly vague. Uh, that was incredibly vague on that side of the house. Thirdly, they said you have access to more consumers when you have a single currency. Again, no analysis, right? Switzerland is a counter example to this. They use the franc. They still have access to the single market. No analysis as to why more consumers are likely to be possible. So this debate isn't about access to the free market, even if it is, we think that it is marginal. This debate is about a world in which you have individual currencies or not. So we could obviously prefer a world where Greece stuck with the drachma, where France stuck with the franc and Germany stuck with the Deutschmark. Why is it better for these individual countries, for these smaller countries, when they have control over their currency? Opening government said that these smaller countries largely are dependent on primary goods. We think the reason goes beyond that. We think the reason is often these countries are not fully diversified, right? So countries such as Portugal often depend on a comparative advantage with regards to, say, the sale of wine. The same with Italy, which is dependent on wine and dairy products, right? So we think in a world where these countries aren't already diversified, we would much rather prefer they have their own currency. Why? Because understand how the euro is priced, right? The euro is priced by an aggregate of the, all the economies in the single currency market, right? So the euro is priced based on like the trade surf surplus and deficits of Germany, France, Greece, Portugal, and Italy, which means that for all these smaller countries, the euro is still going to be stronger than what their individual currencies are because the economies of Germany and France is always going to pull the, like the value of the euro up compared to what they would had they not had, had they not been part of the single market. But even then, we think it's we think that's problematic because having a higher euro means it's more expensive for other countries to trade with you, right? It makes your exports highly uncompetitive because it's more expensive to other countries to buy your goods. Why is drachma better? And this is coming specifically from closing uh, from from closing government. We think it's better because a you have control over things like quantitative easing and interest rates, right? Like it's, it's incredibly vague why uh, why like opening opposition said that the euro is going to be more stable. They said two things. They said firstly big countries now have incentives to jack up rates to screw small countries over. Like firstly, Germany has an incentive to keep the Deutschmark devalued so that its own exports become competitive, right? It's unclear why big countries do not want to trade with smaller countries. We don't think that's a concern in this debate. But in terms of stability of currency, right? Like, look, you can peg your currency to the Deutschmark if trade is your most important concern, right? So Hong Kong pegs the Hong Kong dollar to the US dollar because Hong Kong's trade with US is very, very important to them. So there are measures you can implement to ensure that your currency moves along with the Deutschmark in terms of your foreign reserves, right? So no analysis as to why the euro is going to be more stable. We think there are measures that you can take as a smaller country, but as long as you have control over your exports, your currency is likely to be lower. It means you're likely to export more. And here's why we say that diversification is more important on our side of the house, right? Because in a world where you're able to export more and you have control over your currency, you now have more, like, you will now have more funds to diversify into different economies as opposed to a world where you have a stronger euro compared to your own currency, where you don't have the ability to diversify. It was unclear why they're going to diversify with the euro existing currently anyways. So we think that is moved. But this debate is also about currency controls when they're actually needed, right? Like we think Greece went into recession for three key reasons. This is something OG missed out as well. And Portugal and Italy are slowly heading towards it because they're dead in peace. Like firstly, because even despite, and we we'll take opposition at their best, even despite Germany, Germany's and France's best intentions to keep like a devalued euro saying that it's good for you because, you, like, because now you can export more. We think the problem was that Greece ended up spending more than they were saving and earning, right? So that's the problem in this debate. But 
But secondly, when they needed bailouts, terms were set largely by countries who were contributing the most to that bailout, which were countries like Germany and France. Right? But also you need a perfect consensus within the ECB as to setting the terms of that bailout, something Greece couldn't get on that side of the house because you need like the consensus of countries like Poland and Germany and France to set terms that Greece wanted. These countries didn't want to do that, hence they imposed such heavy austerity because they were also responsible to their own people. Before moving on to how we uniquely solve this with the drachma, I will take any POI from closing. No? Um, Um, yeah, okay. economies can still be intertwined and co-dependent on our world. Like Switzerland's economy is still heavily dependent on the European single market because a lot of their trade is with this market. It's unclear why that's unique. But why is the world with drachma better? We say firstly in terms of before recession, how could this problem be controlled? We say firstly, you can control things like interest rate changes to control spending and lending within Greece when you have control over the drachma. So that means that that debt could be stopped earlier. But secondly, you have control over how much currency actually leaves Greece. Right? The problem now is that Greece has no control over how many euros are leaving Greece and going to Germany. Therefore, people earning in Greece are spending elsewhere in the euro. You now have control when you have the drachma and that means you can control things like that. But secondly, even assuming recession happened after recession, having a drachma is better because you can impose things like currency controls that suit your needs Right? you don't have to do extreme austerity, but also you can be bailed out on your own terms Right? because currently the reason Greece can't be bailed out by anyone other than the EU is because they, like the ECB doesn't want another country to bail because essentially you have to bail the euro out, not Greece out. When the Greece has a drachma, it means other investors or other countries can actually bail them out and Greece can better negotiate terms that it sets on its own. It doesn't have to impose austerity. It can do things like open its market up. That means people don't have to starve and businesses can thrive. We are most concerned about these vulnerable countries. I think I'm having enough document for this. Okay, because this is a regrets motion, we need to be very clear about what happened during history and what happened through the recent years. So we're talking about all the consequences that, that, that started with the invention of the euro. Now notice, this means that a lot of things stay the same in the world. For example, <coughs> free movement of people stays the same in, 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 uh, inside the, the European Union, stays the same. This means that if I am a very skilled worker inside of Greece, I have a lot of incentive to go to Germany where I can get a better wage. This means that Greece loses a lot of good manpower, manpower which can save it from the economic crisis <coughs> um, um, to Germany because people are better off living in Germany than in Greece. Now notice, the economic crisis would have happened as well because it's a global economic crisis. Now, this is very bad news for Greece. This is very bad news for Italy and Portugal and all of the other worse off countries in the European Union. Why? Because when there is a global economic crisis, this means that all, all, of, the, um, uh, all of the trade in the world is, is done much less. This means a lot of people go to cheaper countries and, 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 and uh, um, take, take products from them. And notice that especially the, the, um, the West was uh, affected larger than um, um, than de developing countries. This means that, for example, some products in India might be now cheaper to bring from India than to bring from Greece. Why is this bad news? Because Greece has a bad economy anyway. It doesn't change under this motion. Why is that? Because Greece has 
tens of years of, of, of worker unions that are that are, are, are stroking its economy and preventing uh, and preventing good economic reforms because we know that its debt was too large to um, 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 to deal with. This can change because of just because there is a joint uh, economy. The debt is, is generated throughout generations. This means that it needed economic reforms to happen, and they didn't happen in time. What does this all mean? This means that once we, we, we prove to you that the specific change that really happened in time was only the codependency of countries within the European, uh, European Union, of Germany now being more dependent on Greece, even though they, uh, we, we get from closing government, they are dependent before. It, it might be the case. We don't understand why it's true and why you can't just throw Greece off the rails. But but, but, but now when you have the same currency, you have no option but to address Greece. And this is good, very good news for Greece. This is the actual change in the role. Now, two points in my speech. First of all, um, <clears throat> um, why on the comparative it's better than currency fluctuation that Germany helps Greece out? Second of all, why politically the crisis, the, um, um, the uh, migrant crisis would have, been, uh, would have happened anyway and why it was dealt with better? First of all, let's do some rebuttal. So, when we hear that these that, that Greece isn't diversified and and, and it needs a, 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 a currency of its own, the the economic crisis would have hit it anyway. The, the question is now how you solve this crisis. And this is our um, um, our first point. Now about um, about other hel other countries helping out Greece. We don't understand who has an interest. I mean, even in the best case scenario, if if, co if closing governments say Germany, Germany and, uh, and Greece are all already codependent in some way, then still Germany is the one who to, to, to help. So we don't understand the real change. The thing is that <clears throat> when Germany has now a larger incentive to actually intervene, then a few things happen. First of all, we have much less commissions over exchange rates. This means that if I am a business owner and I have a lot of money inside of Germany, then I'm not then investing in a country like Greece is now something that is much more easy for me to do because now I have less commissions to uh, in the way. This means that a lot more investments go from Germany to Greece when you have a joint currency. Moreover, we say once the once the economies are actually codependent. Then, then economic instability in Greece actually affects economic instability in Germany. So because Greece is economic, economically unstable anyway, because it has all of these worker unions struggling in its economy, and because the economic, economic crisis would have hit, hit anyway, the immediate consequence of this is that Germany now has a larger incentive of bailing it out. It has a larger incentive of, 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 of reducing the amount of debt that, um, that, that Greece has to pay. It has a larger incentive of actually taking care of the Greek economy and demanding uh, economic reforms from Greece, which wouldn't have happened anyway. Maybe countries would have just suggested, yeah, just get, uh, we let go of some of the debt and you do some things, but Greece needed drastic economically economic reform. This happens only if these countries take care of her, if, if, only if countries actually care of what's happening um, over there before I continue opening. Even though the European little little value from Greece is primary industries like the degree sector, why would it be in a better position to achieve financial stability when France and Germany dictate conditions on which aid is country? So even if the dairy the, the, the dairy is, is little, once Greece is in trouble, then more, more risk is done to the, the EU EU's economy. This means that once you have a joint currency, a lot less people want to invest in the EU as a whole because you have you can have like um, <clears throat> um, so because you can have like a, a, a debt crisis with Greece. But this means that in the end. Now Germany has more incentive of taking care of Greece and the little countries, and this is actually um, um, helpful. Now, um, okay. Now, what what happens with? Now, look. Notice that the same thing happens when we talk about the refugee crisis, right? Because this again causes a lot of risk in these poorer countries, specifically in Greece and Italy, which have a poorer economy and don't have the funds to deal with it. This means that once uh, once we have this codependence economically, then Germany again has a lot more incentive of taking care of these refugees. It has a lot more incentive of dividing them around um, 
um, uh, around the continent. This means the refugees are taken care of in a much better way. This means that, that they are better off. Greece and Italy are especially better off. And why is this so important? Because OG cares so much about Euroscepticism and, and, and the effects of this. But notice that <coughs> Euroscepticism in countries like Italy and Greece and stuff like that would, would have been much worse if they would have had this large economic crisis. Now it's divided by all of the countries together. So this means that Euroscepticism is much smaller than what we would have seen actually um, um, in, real, in, in, in real life. This means that less borders are being sealed because if you don't have codependence with Greece, then you can just seal off the border between Greece and the rest of the EU because you don't really care about it. Now you, you don't have any any, uh, any any other thing to do. You have to take care of the, the refugee crisis, and this is the actual change that happened because of the euro. Thank you, Member of Opposition, for that speech. I invite the government to the blue piece of side. God, God, God. All sides in this debate agree that trade is mutually beneficial. What we bring you specifically from closing government is that trade relies on the ability for companies to use financial instruments to get the benefits of that trade. We, what's the metric by which you judge this debate? The metric by which you judge is which team provides you the alternative world and compares that versus the, the failings of the euro as we saw in history. We thought of closing government, we were the only team that gave you an example, like gave you analysis about what this alternative world will look like and why that's better on our side. We did this in multiple ways. I'm going to go step by step. The first thing I'm going to do is talk to you about local industries, and this will deal directly with closing opposition's extension. Second, I'm going to talk to you about better recovery and what alternatives are there for countries to exploit the point of which they're not pegged to the euro. Finally, I'm going to talk to you about the ability to have a unified market. And after all of this, like I'm going to deal with this idea of whether Germany and France has good or bad intentions or whether that's even relevant in this debate. Firstly, on this idea of like what this alternative world looks like, what did it bring to you first? We told you that local industries are likely to be developed at the point which you're not pegged to the euro. What does CEO say to this? They say, one, Greece will be bad anyway because most of the Greeks will migrate towards Germany. There's a few problems with this. One, that while it's true that some people will migrate more, Imports for Greece from Germany will still become expensive because if there's no euro, this means that uh, this, if there's no euro, Greeks still have to pay more to buy a German product than to make a product inside Greece. What does this do? It gives a profit incentive for Greeks to set up their own local industries in areas where they can compete with Germany, which means that the comparative was a world where they just import that material, or import that product from Germany because it's made cheaper there. But the point of this, the Deutsche Mark is now like at a higher value than the drachma. It means there is an economic cost to buy it from Germany as opposed to make it yourself. That pushes for that kind of diversification the op opposition wanted in this debate because you, for the first time, create a profit incentive to actually invest in Greece to get that kind of development. The second thing to say on this, that even if it was the case that you have like rural, like Greek to German or developing country to developed country migration, the euro gave a double whammy in this debate. Right? Because of the fact that to the point at which if Greece is going to fail anyway, we were the team that provided to you why recovery of Greece is better in a world where you have control over instruments of recovery like quantitative easing where you print your own money or you can buy debt from the international market and buy debt from other banks like American banks, as opposed to only being able to buy debt from the European Central Bank. That was something that was still on our side. The second thing closing opposition says is that if this was, wasn't a problem of the European Union, but it was a problem of a global economic crisis. Okay? This, uh, which means that in, the, in our world, more people will start buying stuff from India as opposed to buying stuff from Europe. We think there's a problem with this. Firstly, to the point of view, the Eurozone still exists. Uh, there still benefits the Europe that gets in terms of movements of goods and services. So materials produced in Greece still benefit from the movement of raw material from other parts of Europe to Greece. So there's still 
more competitive than India, which is a completely sovereign state where they have to import all their raw materials. So the India has to import steel from China as opposed to the Eurozone where you can import raw materials from other members of the Eurozone. So that benefits the Eurozone still stand, right? It is still compared to developing countries remain competitive even if it was a global economic crisis. That was a problem. But even if you don't buy that, they never once analyzed how the Euro helps it helps them recover in the case there was a global economic crisis because Greece is still in recession. So there, there wasn't any comparative on that side of that. the last thing closing opposition said in terms of local industries and investing is to say two things. One, that Germans invest in Greece more because the currency is the same. And secondly, that the international market invests in Europe more because there's the euro, there's the euro, right? There's two things to say here. One, that just like Germans invest more in Greece, because if, if it is true that Germans invest more in Greece because the currency is the same, we, uh, we think the converse is also true, right? Which means a lot of the rich Greeks create industries in Germany as opposed to Greece because the, of the comfort, comfortable lifestyle the closing opposition want to talk about. So this idea that they want to push for a benefit is a double-edged sword. The final thing on your investing in the Europe, the European Union as a whole. We think countries still, like the international market, still continues to invest in local government, local countries because they have an incentive to, right? Different investors can take different levels of risk. So right now there are safe investors that invest in the euro. But in a world where you have different con like countries with different level with like different currencies, it means that a, a more risky investor who wants to make a higher return on equity can choose to invest in Greece rather than Germany because he's going to get a higher return if he invests in Greece because Greece is likely to have greater economic development in a world where uh, because uh, greater economic development because Germany's economic development is kind of cap. So that's how we showed you that local industries are better on our side of the what is then the, in, the, in the alternative world? The other thing we told you in alternative world is that we still have a unified market because of the fact that currencies are extremely liquid and you still have the benefit of reduced tariffs for trade, but you still have the benefits of goods and services moving and that still remains on our side of the house. Before I move on, I'll take a point. From you. Okay, um, moving on. Uh, the final thing to say on the alternative world we presented to you is that we told you that countries can make good decisions because they have a greater incentive to make good decisions. This was agnostic to whether Germany or France are good actors or bad actors in this debate. Because we told you that irrespective of the fact that whether Germany is oppressive or France is oppressive, by virtue of there being a euro where Germany, where Germany being more economically developed and having more exports automatically pushes the value of the euro up. This means that irrespective of whether opening opposition wants to say that Germany has an incentive to help Greece or irrespective of the OG wants to say where Germany has an incentive to harm Greece, we would think that showed you that regardless of these incentives, they always end up harming the like, weaker countries because of the fact that because of the fact that by virtue of them benefiting of the euro means that, that Greece can't use a weaker drachma to be competitive in international trade. The second reason that despite good intentions they're harmful is to say that like, the, the, the Greece is able to buy debt in a world where they do undergo the recession that they spoke to you about. Which means that in like, our world they were able to negotiate with international markets and get like, like run a budget deficit and if the worst case if they can fund the budget deficit through inflation they just print a large amount of money. So in the worst case they can still like, recover the economy by the like, quantitative easing which couldn't happen in their world because quantitative easing is determined by the European Central Bank and not at the end of this debate, closing government was the uh, closing government was the only team to give you a comparative word, and the only team that to deal with the economic reasons for why like the smallest countries in the base will must be worse off because of the euro. We're very proud. Well, I thank the government group for their speech and invite the opposition to conclude this side of the other.
The only alternative to an economic crisis that side government provides is that they take care of the matter by, I don't know, fluctuating their currency, printing more currency, printing less currency. Note the example of Zimbabwe. When Zimbabwe was in an extreme crisis, what happened is that they started taking care of it by fluctuating the currency. What they did was that they printed far too much money, which means that the entire value of their currency got devalued, and eventually there was not no reform that they were able to achieve. Which is why we believe that we shouldn't let countries in crisis simply dictate the terms of how they want to move forward, because they're likely to cater to populist moves, and they're likely to print more money rather than impose austerity, simply because it appeases the population of their country more without realizing that the implications of these harms are far more in the future, right? Because governments have an incentive to make sure that the next election goes okay, and that the country as a whole does not revolt against them, which means that they're not likely to take into account longer term effects. Note, this is an incentive that countries like Germany and UK don't have, because they're not concerned about the next election cycle, which means that they're more likely to make moves that will benefit the economy on a longer run, such as impose austerity, because they want the entire currency of the continent to remain stable. Let's deal with the first thing that comes out of government bench, right? They say, and this mainly comes out with from the closing bench, is the fact that closing of government comes out and says that at the point of time at which you don't have the same currency, you can have something like your currency has less value, which means that the products built in Germany are more expensive for you, which means people within your country are going to buy your products rather than products from Germany. No, most of these countries are developing countries, which means that they don't have good industry set up, which means I'm still likely to buy products from these higher or more developed countries like Germany for the simple reason that those products are good. And for the second reason that most of these countries just simply don't have these industries set up. As my member pointed out to you, we're talking about things that happened in history, which means we're talking about things like the Greece crisis in general, right? which means that to actually invest in homegrown industries, the country needs to have a certain amount of money that it can pump into this. Note, most of these developing countries wouldn't have money, and even if they did, they would be printing this currency at the cost of the economy in general. What does this mean, right? In their world, what happens is countries like, Greece, countries like Germany and UK have no incentive to invest in these countries, which means you have competition between more developed companies where you know, Greece would still continue to buy products from say, Germany and UK, and you would have homegrown industry that would suffer. What happens when you have an entire continent that acts as one economy and one market? Germany now has an incentive to pump money into these homegrown industries, which the country as a whole didn't have. Germany now has an incentive to help these industries to go because if it has a partner in these industries, it can profit from it as a whole. Germany also has an incentive to set up industries within Greece simply because it can cater to a larger market, which means as a whole, you have money being found in these economies, which would not have happened in the comparison if the country was simply isolated. Let's see the second thing that comes out from that, right? They say, at the point of time at which Greece is part of a European Union, it isn't able to compensate the terms of its health, right? We tell you that Greece can even now take health from the international fund. Just because you're part of the European Union doesn't mean that you can no longer avail the international organizations such as the Monetary Fund, right? We tell you the reason why Greece doesn't avail these funds is because UK and Germany are more likely to be beneficial to them. Why is that? Right? Because their currency is tied together. If Greece goes down, they go down. This is the simple reason why Germany paid off several of Greece's loans, right? Simply because they realize that at the point of time which Greece doesn't pay any of its loans, it's extremely harmful to the European currency as a whole and our economy. <laughs> What is the marginal benefit of having the euro as a social policy? What's the fall of benefits that we've given you of these of these having a draft? Germany still has an incentive to trade with a lot of countries like India and China. Yes, it would have a greater incentive to trade with a country that is within its own bloc, because if the country does well, its currency as a whole does well, which means that its imports are likely to be benefited, right? Let's see, which is the important extension that we brought out to you from closing, right? We initially brought out to you the fact that how these countries do have a unique incentive. And the second thing that we brought out is extremely important, right? When the European 
Union has the economies interlinked together, when the continent as a whole faces crisis such as the immigrant crisis, they're more likely to work together with one another to solve it. Right? Simply because I can't have all the immigrants being piled on to one economy because it affects the economy in general. In the absence of the economies being linked together, it is okay for one country to pile all of these immigrants, which means that you're more likely to have terms and conditions being negotiated when it is one economic bulk as a whole at take over. So one thing that opening comes out and tells us is that most of these countries are dependent on primary industry. No. In the developed world, we've realized that service industries and industrialization is beneficial yeah, for the yeah. development of a country as a whole. We can't simply depend on dairies and farms for the country to develop as a whole. In the absence of a, of a unified bloc that actually intervenes and in, results in industrialization of St. Greece, countries are likely to become inward looking, but they would only be involved in dairies and farming and all of those things. These activities are often developed are dependent on several things such as weather conditions. No, the most of the African countries that often develop policies simply based on agriculture don't develop because you need to have policies that are also favoring things like imports and policies that are favoring things like industrialization. We tell you that the point of time at which Greece is linked to the country that is more developed and has more of a forward looking, more investment coming to these countries simply because you don't have to go through the commissions that have been involved, you don't have to go through barriers that would happen in the presence of a fluctuating currency. We also tell you that the point of time at which you have a currency, at the point of time at which you know that Greece is stable simply because it's linked to the European Union as a whole, other countries get incentivized to pump money into the Greece even after a huge crisis such as the Greece recession taking place because you know in the worst case scenario the country is taken care of. At the end of this debate, we tell you that the opposition side is the only one that has looked into issues to the immigrant crisis that actually happened. We told you why. But the incentive to invest only exists when your economies are linked together and you've proven to you that even in the international fund exists, Germany and Britain have a greater incentive to help these. For all of these reasons, we're very proud of this. I think you're the best speech I invite you to cross the floor and shake hands. We've got some few minutes for deliberations.